All right, great. Uh, my name is Nikolai. I'm here representing Nexus Developments. Uh, we're a Ethereum R&D shop and consultancy. And among other things, we publish open source software to help other developers. The one I'm going to focus on today is called Dapple. So what is Dapple? Uh, Dapple is a developer tool for people targeting the Ethereum virtual machine. It's a collection of utilities that are mostly loosely coupled, but they all center around a common data model, which is one of our major key innovations from my point of view. So I'll go through all these real quick, and then I'll go into a little more detail. Um, the, the main thing is this shared data model, which we call the DAP file. Um, and it's a, basically a descriptor for both um, co code packages and also deployed systems. And then chain forking, creating local chain forks, and then having modified EVM behavior on those local chain forks. These three things together let you do some really interesting things. And in particular, the entire like, development workflow of creating contract systems that talk to other contract systems is really, uh, uh, it helps a lot to have these features. So let me just go through um, each of these again. Uh, the first thing is that the key insight that drives this first innovation is that Ethereum land is slightly different from uh, most of the other uh, uh, you know, programming language environment uh, worlds because in Ethereum, you, we actually all share a global uh, runtime environment. And so this blurs the line between something that's a code package and something that's a uh, like an instance or like a deployed uh, code object. So this would be like um, if you hard code like a web endpoint into your uh, JavaScript package or something, that's considered bad practice. Um, you want to like separately have it depend on a configuration where there you configure your endpoints and then have all the logic in, in, in your code. Um, but in Ethereum, you have things like, say, the Ether token wrapper, which is stateful. It's a deployed object that you interact with. but it's also um, not, there's absolutely no reason to redeploy it. Everyone should be treating it sort of like a library. Like, you know, you have the math library on Ethereum. Everyone uses the same address, or in theory, we should be doing that for uh, the math functions. Likewise, we should all be using the same um, uh, package for like the Ether token wrapper, which creates it into an ERC20 token. Uh, but that has an address in it. That's part of the like, definition of that code package is that there's an object deployed. Um, so, yeah, so this is an example DAP file. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, the key thing is this highlighted thing, which is that the, the type information uh, is very rich. It has all the metadata we need to just fully recreate how this thing got here. So the next innovation is chain forking. You'll notice it's a, it's a, um, a user experience very similar to Git. That's because they're very similar data structures. The missing part here is merge, because there's no analog to resolving merge conflicts automatically when you try to replay a set of transactions, and it doesn't have the same result. Um, so that's chain forking. And finally, OK, yeah, this is an example of uh, basically you can actually fork any uh, public Ethereum chain without their permission, basically, just because of how the data structure works. Uh, but by default, we yeah, let you uh, specify a remote one. And internal just means a brand new blank EVM um, on your machine and fork ETCM more than should be self-explanatory. Um, and finally, EVM extensions are when you slightly change the behavior of the virtual machine on your private chain. Um, and this lets you do some really interesting things, as you'll see. So now let's uh, go through the workflow, how, how we developed apps using Dapl. First thing, find some dependencies. This is like a, a habit that you have in every other language. But for some reason, everyone wants to start from scratch when they're creating their own contracts. Um, this is our, uh, as a hint, we suggest that we have like something like sort of like a standard library, um, which we are keen to get formally verified. Um, and it has a lot of stuff like proxy actors, tokens, blah, blah, blah. You can read the list. Um, I'm sure, yeah, the idea is that these are uh, like composable building blocks. Each is very simple and easy to verify and then um, you actually, most dApps can be built out of just a collection of things. Like very few, like uh, each dApp that each new system that we make usually only has like one or two contracts with custom logic, and then it has like five dependent contracts that are just things we've built before. So again, yeah, if you're interested in formal verification, this is a this. I mean, these uh, again, it's very simple contracts, but they are in uh, production systems right now in multiple systems. Like nothing in here is something that hasn't been reused. So yeah, the next step is building and linking, which is boring. But uh, it's worth noting that Solidity has no namespaces. And this is kind of a smell that our contract systems haven't really gotten that complicated yet. Um, Maker Core, for example, has four different deployed DAPSIS versions. And being able to reproduce and compile without having like type name collisions requires us to have a custom linker. So we're going to maintain that until Solidity gets namespaces. Um, so uh, after you've written some contracts and you've built them, you obviously want to test them. And our perspective on this is that the primary consumer of contracts is other contracts. And so we um, 
emphasize writing your test of solidity, pretending your other contracts and communicating with it. And for this, we have a magic test contract uh, where it has an associated harness that understands how to interpret uh, the functions defined on it. So this is our first example of, uh, of chain forking. So this is, this is uh, an example test. Uh, if you've used any unit testing framework in other, in other languages, this should be familiar. Setup gets called every time. And then if you have multiple test functions, they each get called in isolation. So our first example of uh, using chain forkings, this is, uh, suppose we did a DAPL chain new and we, and we um, uh, specified the internal VM, which means like a, a brand new, fresh EVM. Then we deploy our contract to it, call setup, and then concurrently we can fork it and, and run each test independently. Um, so that's nice. Uh, but we really want to, uh, so, so like part of the value of DAPL is that we can take these dependent systems and make a very accurate mock of them and we preserve all the type of information. You can be very certain that the behavior will be similar on the live chain and on your uh, fake local chain. But you might as well just use the real thing. I mean, it's even better. Uh, so uh, in this example, uh, basically you write a test and you assume that the contract is running in the context of like a, of an existing chain, but you can do more stuff with it in your private context that lets you uh, um, test a few more features. So to give a concrete example of this, um, if you run this in the Morden context, uh, this will work. But if you run this on a private internal chain, uh, this won't work because, in, you know, unless you burn some uh, ether first. So uh, I, I should have like uh, written the usage behind this, but basically what happens is first you enter the, enter the Morden context and then you do DAPL test on this uh, contract and the result is that it works. Um, this address zero refers to uh, address zero on Morden, and so when you assert that the burned balance is more than zero, it's true. All right, so testing is kind of interesting, but it gets really interesting when we want to uh, deploy contracts, which is one of the applications of what we call wallet side scripting, which is another e uh, magic EVM uh, contract, but its harness has hijacked the create and call opcodes and makes uh, what usually when you have create or call, it creates a message call, it's like internal to one transaction, but instead what we do is actually create a full transaction and then block the wallet side EVM execution until it gets confirmed. Um, and you combine this with the chain forking feature, what you can do is simulate live deployments before you actually do them, do dry runs, and then you can run consistency checks on the result of your system, like make sure that you, your up, the update that you want to do uh, doesn't screw anything up. So here's a real world example of like when we want we might want to do this. Uh, you're on Slack and you get a message from me that says, hey, please confirm proposal 66. It is a critical bug fix. It's going to swap out some of the contracts with ones that uh, have, don't have this bug. So if you're a responsible uh, administrative multi-sig holder of whatever system you're running, you will, of course, uh, do a mock uh, chain fork and uh, uh, run this tra transaction in a simulated environment to make sure that it still passes whatever consistency checks you guys have defined. In our case, let me show you the example. Um, so this is why um, uh, this, this type information, uh, preserving this type information in the DAP file is so powerful is that then we can hoist it into um, the wallet side scripting environment and have the full type system there uh, with all the type information it needs to make sure that this, uh, you know, what you're doing makes sense. There's actually a token defined in the environment. It's actually typed as a token. It has a confirm function, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so in this case, what we're doing is uh, we're confirming it's from our address, but then we're fit, pretending to set the origin to a different address, which is one of the magic features of the script contract, um, so that the, the origin is mocked. Then we do a confirmation from that origin, and then we, um, so in this example, the confirm also does the trigger, so the update runs, and then we do a consistency check. And in this example, you can see, oh, our made up consistency check failed, so you know that this wasn't actually me, this was some hacker that is trying to run a bad update on the system, but each multi-sig member can easily independently verify what the resulting state of actually running those transactions are. All right. And then the final step is publish your DAP file. Get other people to import your code and ha have some code reuse because there's so much duplication of effort going on in the ecosystem right now, and it's partially because it's just so hard to reuse other people's code. Um, so I'm going to very quickly uh, give a very small sneak peek about what are some other things that are coming. Basically, all the things I described could be done in a GUI. Um, so you could uh, you know, do your own the DAO hack through a, through a clicky UI uh, if you want to. Um, Let's see. 
And then some more things that we have in the pipeline uh, are better, uh, more wallet side EVM extension features. So one thing is uh, having one of the addresses be like a hard coded contract, which is a thin client. And so this is called, I call it DIY sharding. Basically, if you have two private chains, you can make up your own inter-blockchain communication scheme very easily if you have um, uh, the thin clients for the other chain as a, as a EVM extension or like a hard-coded contract. Likewise, uh, 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 creating like a mint opcode would allow you to uh, write your private chain's consensus mechanism in the EVM. And finally, um, system calls allow you to bridge the old world web with the uh, uh, new world, EV, you know, thin proofs for everything. Uh, and you can have like a dedicated uh, side chain that say does SMS relay, like this is the example we have, right? So it does this, uh, it does SMS.send, but it might inside this function uh, and it emits an event and this is like a proof that this company claimed that they sent an SMS at this time uh, in response to some action that you did. And so this is, uh, you know, the general direction we're moving towards. Um, and so that's actually all I have to talk about. Thank you for listening. Uh, let's go to lunch.